Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. You guys are so amazing. Okay, I have to say this, though. I feel like you guys need to applaud yourselves because you guys are in, like, the prime of your life. It's a beautiful summer night. There are a hundred other things that you could be doing, but you've chosen to be here to grow closer to the Lord, build community amongst yourselves. So give your ha- yourselves a hand. You guys are the awesome ones. You guys are here. You guys make this place so, so great. And Connor and Andrew, thank you for giving me this platform for a moment to share. Um, I know that there has been some big mega people that have stood right here. And so I do not take it lightly that you have asked me to share with all your people tonight. So I love you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Yes, Andrew did do a quick welcome of my family, but does say give honor where honor is due. And I want to honor my husband, Brent, that is here. Um, He is amazing. Guys, we've been married almost 17 years, if you can believe that. And sometimes we look at each other like, we did it. It's like a miracle. Every Yay, we did it another year. But no, he is incredible. And he has been my number one supporter. He has um, believed in my story, believed in me as a woman in ministry. So thank you for cheering me on along the way for all of these years. And then my beautiful daughter, my mini-me, Felicity Joy Fassett. Um, guys, she's going to be a freshman at Columbine. Any rebels out there? Any? Yeah. Woo! Yeah. Rebel pride. So right there future generation. So Felicity's here, and then my parents, Dan and Robin, are here with me, and they are, like, literally, I physically would not be here without them, so thank you for that, but also, I would not be the person that I am today without their prayers, support, having a safe home, so I love you guys. Thank you very much for coming. Um, So you guys have been in a series. When Andrew uh, asked me to share, it was a very open, like, Jesus is blank. And this side of eternity, we could stay in the series forever because our God is so big and so great and so vast and so wide. There's not enough time to like touch on all the points, but I instantly knew what I wanted to share on. And so if you're taking notes, you better be taking them in your good goods journal. Where are you, Zach Atwood? Get your journal out. If you're not taking notes in that journal, they're not as holy and they're not, they don't count as much. So hook it up with Zach afterwards to get one of those. But the title of my message is Jesus is the key to forgiveness. So can we just pray? We don't want to go a minute more without inviting the Holy Spirit to join us. If you could bow your heads and just pray with me. Father God, thank you so much. Lord Jesus, thank you for your sweet sweet, tangible presence. Lord, we dedicate this night. We dedicate um, every moment to you. We would be remiss if you would not be exalted in this place today. Lord Jesus, you say that your word is sharper than any two-edged sword. It does not return void. So I pray right now that your word would go forth, that it would pierce hearts, that there would be conviction and change. We love you oh so much. And it's in your precious name that we pray. Amen. All right, you guys ready? Let's get started. All right, so we are, oh, you guys, thanks, guys. I appreciate, you know, when you're like 36, it's nice to hear that once in a while. You don't hear it as often. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But, um, okay, so my story starts a few years back, so we do have to travel back in time just a little bit. Any homeschool people? Was anybody homeschool? Yay! My people! Okay, we have a special connection, right? You have, like, homeschoolers, you're either, like, super cool or you're super not cool. So I hope you're, like, on the super cool side. Okay, good. We're good. So I was homeschooled from second grade all the way to my freshman year of high school. And every year I would ask my mom, is this the year I can go to school? Is this the year I want to go to school? Like, I could not wait. So it was the summer of eighth grade, and my mom finally said, I feel like the Lord has released me to release you, and you'll be going to Columbine High School this year, and I could not wait. I was so excited. I wanted the whole experience, you know, the football games, the dances, a locker, a backpack, teachers that were other than my mom, you're great, but like outside of that, and I, you know, the boys, like get ready for school. I don't have to wear pajamas every day, like get ready, look cute, do the whole thing, and I was ready. I loved it. I loved everything about my freshman year. It was so great. Spring is here, and our year is winding down. My freshman year is winding down, and it was a beautiful, sunny Tuesday. I got up, got ready for school as normal, and went to class April 20th of 1999. And little did I know that that day would mark my life forever. 
I had a huge science project that was due. We were in the rhythm of uh, finals, and so I had this project that, of course, I procrastinated on because that's who I am, and I had to do it that day. So I had already told all my friends, I will not be going down into the cafeteria for lunch today. I'm headed straight to the library. I have to get this project done. And so I was walking towards the library. You know, the lunch bell rang. It was time to go to lunch and walked past this staircase that went to the lower level of the school where the cafeteria was. And this, like, smell of delicious Chick-fil-A came up the stairs. And I just stopped. And I was like, what is that? Oh, it smells so good. And I stood there, and I had to make a decision. I'm looking at the library door. I could go there, do my project, and probably get a great grade. Or I could go downstairs, enjoy some Chick-fil-A, and make my friends help me with my project. And so Chick-fil-A won that day. I went downstairs to the cafeteria, threw my backpack on the floor, like instantly forgot about this project. I remember just laughing with my girlfriends. We had a camera, like the old school ch -ch kind that you like took a picture. You had to wait two weeks to see if your eyes were actually open in the picture. And we taking pictures, just having a great time. And I remember taking, like just getting ready. I was lifting my sandwich from my plate, getting ready to take a bite. When I saw David Sanders, who was my computer teacher at the time, and a janitor come bursting into the cafeteria doors. And they had their hands above their heads, and they were screaming and shouting at us at the top of their lungs. And they were saying, get on the floor, cover your heads, get down, get down, get down, get underneath the tables. And so instantly, we obeyed, we crawled on the floor, we co covered our heads, and I remember thinking, like, is this a senior prank we were waiting for? Is this, like, a weird fire drill? What, what is going on? But I will never forget David's face. He was very pale. His eyes couldn't have been any wider. And he had a look of fear, but, like, urgency in his, in his eyes. And so we were underneath the table. It was kind of a weird moment to, like, be, look around and see all your classmates huddled, looking at each other, like, what in the world is this about? It's kind of hard to judge time, but just a few short moments after we were um, told to get underneath the tables, I heard a young man at the opposite end of the lunchroom from where I was sitting, and he screamed at the top of his lungs, and he said, they have guns, everybody run, and I heard that word gun, and then I heard the word run, and chaos just broke out in the lunchroom. I tried to, like, crawl out from underneath my table. My hands were getting trampled. I remember getting pushed to the ground several times. Finally, though, I made it to my feet, and I looked around, and I saw papers and food and um, backpacks and people pushing each other and chairs flying everywhere. It was just pure chaos and panic. I reached underneath the table and grabbed the hand of my friend and pulled her out, and we just stood there, and we looked at each other, and it was like, without any word spoken, we knew we needed to move. We needed to get out of that room. Well, we noticed that the main flow of students was going back up the staircase to the top level of the school. And so we began to run as fast as we could up the staircase. And I got to about the top step when a teacher opened up her door and she kind of began to scold us. We were not to be upstairs during lunchtime. And she said, why are you kids screaming? What's going on? And right as she said that, I remember looking back down into the cafeteria where I ca just came out of and seeing those kids look back up at us and just see them scream, run, and they were screaming, run. It was just like, go, get out. It was just after that moment that I heard the first gunshots and uh, two seniors, two boys that were getting ready to graduate in just a few short weeks, um, entered the school dressed in army fatigue, long black trench coats strapped with several types of guns and homemade bombs on a mission to kill as many people as they possibly could. And it was a machine gun, so you guys all know what that sounds like. It was very loud, and I just remember it, like, filling the whole school. You couldn't really tell where it was coming from. It just was so loud, and it just echoed through the halls. So I turned my head, and I was like, what do I do? There was no plan at that time in our culture. There was no lockdown plan. There was no do this if there's an intruder in your school. So I didn't know if I should go into a classroom, a closet, if I should huddle in a corner, scream, cry, faint. Like I was just like at a loss. But I turned my head and I just see this long hallway. It's a full length of the school. And it was like, it like lit up. It was like, go that way. 
So I'm holding on to my friend's hand still, and we begin to make our way down this hallway, just kids in the, in the herd of everybody. Um, hearing bullets like ricocheting off of lockers and walls, hearing glass shattering, just hearing like the screams and the shouts. And I knew that if I was to stumble and fall, I would have been trampled. And I don't know, you know, if I would have made it back up to my feet, but I just saw this door and was like, keep going this way. About halfway down the hallway, if any of you have ever been in a life or death situation, you could probably relate to this. But as I was running, it was like I hit a wall and everything around me just went like slow motion, like slow motion matrix style, you know, like a blur. Everything got really, really, really quiet. I hit this wall. I was like, I saw my life flash before my eyes. That was a very real thing. And it was like friends, family, memories, all in front of my face. It was all right there, boom, in a flash. But then I heard the voice of the Lord for the very first time in my life, as clear as can be, like as clear as I'm speaking to you. It, everything's calm around me, and I just hear him say, I will never leave you nor forsake you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. I will never leave you nor forsake you, and I heard it three times, as clear as can be, and it was like in that moment, I knew I was gonna be okay. So I'm holding on to my friend's hand. I look at her and I say, we're going to make it. We're going to make it. And we finally got to the end of this hallway. It felt like we were running forever. Pushed open the door. Like breathed my first breath of fresh air. And I was like, oh, how, like what is happening? There's a police officer right there. He had his gun drawn. And he began to ask us questions. You know, Where are they coming from? How many people have guns? What's going on? And all I could get out was they're coming up from the cafeteria. And he told us to run as fast and as far away from the school as we possibly could get. So we ran down a hill, hopped a fence, crossed the street, hopped another fence into a park. And I remember standing in that park, turning around, looking at this school that I loved so much that I was so excited to be a part of and thinking a few thoughts. Like, this isn't real. This is a nightmare that I'm in right now. Um, who would ever do this? Like, who are these people? Why would they do this to our school? Why would they try and hurt us? And three, who did I possibly talk to today that I'm going to never see again? It was a very real thought. And I could talk for a very long time about all the things and all the stories. And if you ever want to ask me questions, I'm always open to, to share more. But we did lose 12 precious students and the one teacher Mr. Sanders, that came into the cafeteria that warned all of us that there was danger, was actually um, shot in the shoulder, and he bled to death in a science classroom, and he truly is a hero. He saved so many lives, so many kids and teachers' lives that day, but in the aftermath of it all, so many things transpired, but for me, I was like a stuffer of a lot of emotions, stuff, stuff, deal with later, stuff, stuff, won't process that now, stuff, stuff, and it finally all came to a head one day. We were watching TV at home, flipping through the channels, and all of a sudden, like, a violent scene came on, and somebody had a gun and killed a bunch of people, and something, like, triggered, triggering, like, happened, and I didn't even know what that word meant. It's a word now, and so I was triggered, and I was like, something cracked inside of me. And I remember running upstairs to my bedroom, slamming my door, screaming, and this is very out of character for me, but screaming and shouting and throwing things and hitting pillows and why? I was mad at God, I was mad at Eric, I was mad at Dylan, and I hadn't processed any of that. It was just like all this emotion came out, this ugh, and it was ugly and it was nasty and it was scary. And my mom came upstairs and she held me and she put her arms around me and she just began to pray. Praying and prayed and prayed. And finally she said, Lauren, you have to forgive Eric and Dylan for what they did or you will remain one of their victims. And so I had to make a choice. So my first point in our lessons of forgiveness is this. When it comes to forgiveness, we must give freely. Eric and Dylan committed suicide in the library that day. There was never going to be a face-to-face -face reconciliation. I'm sorry for, I apologize, 
please forgive us. There was never going to have, there's never going to be a moment. I will never have a moment like that with them. They didn't ask for it my, in my fleshly mind. They didn't deserve it. I was mad. I was angry. They would never say, we're sorry for killing your friends. We're sorry that you now have nightmares. We're sorry that every time you walk into a crowded room, you are like on edge and filled with anxiety. We're sorry that you go into a crowded place and you immediately look for the exit and find the fastest way out just in case. Every time a balloon pops or a door slams or a car backfires, you crouch and you cower because you're scared. There's never going to be any of that. But Jesus is the ultimate example of this. In Luke chapter 23, he has been beaten He has been bruised. He has been stripped. He has been spit on. He's been made fun, like called on. He's just been like, he is being crucified. Crown of thorns, put on his head, nailed to a tree. Looking down at the Roman soldiers who are gambling over his clothing. And in that moment, those those Roman soldiers don't know what's taking place. But Jesus is being nailed to the cross and cries out to the Father and says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. If Jesus can forgive his murderers in that moment, as one of his last things he ever says on this earth, I do not have a choice but to forgive. So I audibly had to say, I forgive you, Eric. I forgive you, Dylan. And when I said that out loud, something inside of me broke open that was dark and nasty and was festering and was growing. And Jesus supernaturally came in and did a work only he can do. And so when it comes to forgiveness, again, you must give it freely. And now some of you, you have been through some tough stuff. I don't know your stories. I'm sure it's... You've been through things worse than I have. But Jesus does know your story. And he does know where you've been. And he, again, if he can do it, we have no excuse not to. It doesn't mean that, I don't believe in forgive and forget. I don't believe in that at all. I will never forget what happened that day. But what it did do is it gave me access to remember what took place 20 years ago, and it's no longer attached to a sinful reaction such as anger, bitterness, hatred, resentment. I can remember it and see God through it. I can remember it and be like, wow, I experienced that, but because of what Jesus did on the cross, I can stand here and no longer be angry. I can still grieve. I can still be sad. I can still process things, but, but Jesus is with me in that, and it's not attached to sin anymore. So I... I hope that you can hear my heart and what I'm going to say next, okay? This is Andrew's uh, say it straight stuff, right? Okay. Uh, Please hear my heart and know that this is not meant to be an attack um, on anybody here, but I hope that this gives you access to some freedom. Some of you who have experienced some tough stuff, again, like people have hurt you, people that you trust have hurted you, people, maybe this church has hurt you before, Maybe um, parents, educators, I don't know. Whoever it is, whatever your situation may be, you have willfully said, I will never forgive them. I will never forgive them. And you have chosen to remain in a victim mentality mindset. You have built a comfy house, built with your walls, and you have chosen to stay in that place. And I want to encourage you, Today, have the courage to break free out of that. Jesus has called you to a higher standard, and I know that it's hard. I know that it can be scary. I know that you feel like they don't deserve it, but that's not up to you. You don't get to pick and choose who you forgive. You don't get to pick and choose who you're going to offer forgiveness to. And so I want you today to, you might already have somebody in your mind. I want you to hold on to that because I want to give you the opportunity to let that go. If I would not have forgiven Eric and Dylan, they still would have a hold on my life. I would not be the parent that I am to Felicity. I would not be the wife that I am to Brent. I would not be the daughter I am to my parents. I would not be the staff member that I am at Red Rocks Church. If I didn't forgive them, I be still would be held in bondage. And they don't deserve a piece of my life. They don't deserve a piece of my heart. And so neither does anybody else deserve a piece of your heart. 
let it go. Have the courage and the bravery to step out of that. All right, second lesson in forgiveness. We're going to give it freely, and then we're going to ask for it humbly. Would you guys like to see a demonstration of this? Okay, Brent, this week, <laughs> this week was the Nordstrom anniversary sale and Amazon Prime Day in this same week. We may or may not be receiving an abundance of packages to our front door. I would like to ask for your forgiveness at this, in front of all of our brothers and sisters. Okay? No. <laughs> that's not, that's actually extremely passive aggressive and extre like very manipulative. So that's not a good example. But if you have caused somebody pain, suffering, you have caused an offense, don't let your pride get in the way of making that relationship right and bringing restoration. You can talk yourself out of an apology really quick. You can talk, your, oh, you can justify it in your head. You can say, well, I didn't mean to do it. Well, I don't care if you didn't mean to do it. If you've hurt somebody, you need to make it right, and you need to go to that person. You need to handle it. Jesus did that for all of us, right? He forgave us freely. He, like, dealt with it. Like, he is the ultimate example of that. But don't let your excuses get in the way from setting yourself free and somebody else free from their pain. So James, like the most convicting book in the whole Bible, I believe. James chapter 5, verse 16 says this. Therefore, confess your sins to each other. Pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. I love it that it says, confess your sins to each other. Go to those people, confess your sins, say you're sorry, handle it, is paired with healing, and then the powerfulness of your prayers, the effectiveness of your prayers. Don't let a moment go by. If you know that something's festering and there's something not right with the relationship, they may be in this room. You may be over here and they may be over here. And we may need to like handle that. You may need to get on the phone and call somebody and say, I am sorry. Let your pride down. When you do, it allows the Holy Spirit to come in and bring restoration into those relationships. It is freeing. It, it is like the best feeling. Now, they may not accept your apology. They may be like, no, I don't accept it. No, nope. that's on them. That's okay. All you have to do is worry about being obedient to the Father. You're not going to stand before them at the end. You're going to stand before Jesus, and he's calling you to ask for forgiveness and make it right. Okay? Simple, easy, and it may be scary, but you can do it. And once you get in the habit of it, gosh, if I've, like, offended Brent, I, like, want to, I like handle it right then and there. I don't even barely let him leave the room because I'm like, oh, I don't want him mad at me. I need to handle that. I'm sorry. I did that. I'm wrong. Please forgive me. Offer forgiveness right away. Um, okay. Third lesson when it comes to forgiveness. I want you guys to receive it gratefully. So we're going to give it freely. We're going to ask for it humbly. And we're going to receive it gratefully. When Jesus did what he did on the cross, he gave us access for ourselves to receive forgiveness from him, which is so powerful. You may be thinking, like, Lauren, you don't know what I've done, and I'm pretty sure Jesus, it's not on his agenda to forgive me for that. But I'm here to tell you that he already knew all the things that you were going to do, and he still chose to sacrifice his life so you could have access to forgiveness that gives you access to life eternal in heaven with him. Don't believe the lie that you are not worthy enough of it. Don't let shame hold you back from accessing the Father. We all have made mistakes. We've all done some really dumb stuff in our days. But when Jesus sacrifice his life he had to you on his mind and he already knew your sin so don't let the enemy tell you any different in acts verse three or acts chapter three guys you love big bertha let me introduce you this is big bertha 
My Big Bertha Bible, and she is packed with good things to say. Acts chapter 3, verse 19. And everyone's like, that's a really big Bible, Lauren. I'm like, yeah, I like big Bibles, and I cannot lie. So get over it, whatever. <laughs> All right, Acts chapter 3, verse 19. It says, repent then and turn to God so that your sin may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. And if you're looking around in your life and you are not living in a refreshing time, sounds like we might need to do some work. God wants you to live a refreshed life that is pressed down, shaken together, overflowing with blessing that only comes from heaven. He wants you to step into your purpose, but if you are held in the bondage of unforgiveness, hatred, it causes anxiety, it causes stress, it causes a trickle of bad relationships. If you're looking at your life and you're like, I'm not healthy spiritually, emotionally, physically, Jesus is the key to hope. Jesus is the key to love. Jesus is the key to fresh starts. Jesus is to key, the key to life everlasting. Jesus is the key to forgiveness that gives you access to all of those things. And he wants you. He is calling you. He knows your name. He knows how many hairs are on the top of your head. You are not forgotten by him. You are not ignored by him. He created you for a purpose, for a reason, for such a time as this. So don't let the enemy have any hold of it. Every day that I wake up, I am so thankful to be alive. My story could have been very, very different. You see that science project that was due as I was looking at the library? If I would have gone into that library, I don't know what my story would have been. Most of the people that lost their lives that day were in that room. So yes, Chick-fil-A saved my life a little bit. It is Christian chicken, and I probably need to write them a letter and let them know that. But I want to tell you a story about how great our God is. Evil definitely was felt and tangible in this school that day. But there also was a supernatural sense of protection over so many of us. I found out that where my table was, just a few feet away, was the largest bomb that they had made in a trash can out of a propane tank. If that bomb would have gone off, I would not be standing here. But I truly believe that was the power of the prayers of my parents who pray protection over me every day, that that didn't happen. But my friend Heidi, I have to tell her story because it is so powerful. My friend Heidi was in the library, and she was sitting at a table all by herself. Eric and Dylan came into the library. They threw a bomb in. It exploded, filled the room with smoke. They said, everybody in this room, prepare to die. And she got underneath her table, and she started to pray. God, make me invisible. Make me invisible. At one point, she could hear their boots pacing on top of her table. And you see, they were killing kids through the table. So she's like, this is it. It's over for me. I'm, this is the end of my life. This is how I'm going to die. But she kept praying, make me invisible, make me invisible. And at one point, Eric looked underneath the table at her and made eye contact. And she said, Lauren, it was like, you know how they say the eyes are the window to your soul? She's like, it was like, it was blank, darkness, empty, nothing was there. Eric looked under, made eye contact, stood back up. She miraculously was able to escape when they went down into the cafeteria again. Heidi went back into the library with the FBI and detectives to kind of tell her story as they're putting the pieces of this puzzle together. And she said, Lauren, when I got to my section of the library, there was three sections, she was in the last when she got to her section of the library, she said there was like a perfect ring around her table where not even a drop of blood have, had touched it. There was blood everywhere. It looked, and the, the FBI, they were all like, what? 
But she's like, I was here, and you see this ring? That is supernatural protection and a shield about her. And so God fights on your behalf when you call out. And I don't want you to leave this room with any baggage whatsoever. You have the opportunity to leave it right here, right where it belongs. And I know that it can be scary, and I know that it can be hard, but God doesn't put you through anything you can't handle. Greater is he that is in you than he that's in the world, and he gives you the strength and authority as a son and daughter of the King of Kings, Lord and Lords, to deal with stuff and then leave feeling refreshed. Leave feeling like a new creation in him. Leave feeling like I could take on the world because Jesus is with me, and I know that. And no matter what comes my way, he's right by my side, and I, like, There's no better feeling, no better feeling. So when it comes to forgiveness, we're going to give it freely. We're going to ask humbly, and we're going to receive it gratefully. And I want to give you guys some time to do some work because I think that there's work that needs to be done. For you to be an effective young young adult in this culture, in any culture, give yourself permission and space and time to meet with Jesus so he can come in and do what only he can do, the great physician. He gives you the peace that passes all understanding. He is the comforter. He's my best friend. Without him, what's the point? So in a moment, we're going to have time for that, but I would be remiss if I didn't do this. If there's anybody here that does not know the Lord. Listen, we are not guaranteed a tomorrow. That was my slogan and has been my slogan for 20 years. We are not guaranteed a tomorrow. And that's not to live in fear. That's not so you can be scared. But I don't know what's going to happen to you when you leave these doors. I don't get hit by a car, struck by lightning. Who knows? But I do know this. When you surrender your heart, when you surrender your life to Jesus, you are guaranteed all the promises that are in Big Bertha, that are in this word, that is alive and active, and you don't have to live in fear of what's going to happen next. And so I don't want anybody, it's up to you, but the Bible does say today is the day of salvation, not tomorrow, not next week, not when I'm happy, not when everything's going good. It's today, it's in this moment. And so if we could all just bow our heads and close our eyes. I want to give privacy to those. But if that is you and you want to leave here with the assurance of Jesus Christ in your heart in heaven forever, would you just slip up your hand real quick so I can pray with you? Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. I see your hand. Thank you. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Jesus, you're so good and you're so sweet. Thank you, Lord. Father God, I pray for each person that has just raised their hands. Lord Jesus, thank you for their bravery. Thank you that they have chosen to make today the day of salvation for them. God, I pray that you would meet them right where they they are at. They may not understand what's taking place in their hearts, but Jesus, only you do and you can meet them. And God, I pray that they would sense from this moment on a change and a shift in their life. Thank you, Jesus, for that. Thank you, thank you. If you are here and you know you need to do some work, there are some people that you need to forgive. There's some things you need to let go. You want to get out of the victim mentality lifestyle and you want to be set free. If you're here and there's somebody you need to apologize to, I want you to do that in a moment. But if you need a time with Jesus... I truly believe that right up here at this altar, he's going to meet you, and we're going to pray for you, and we can do this hand in hand, arm in arm, together, seeking him, laying it all down so he can do what only he can do. So if you would stand with me. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. You're so good. Jesus is so good. He's so good, and he loves you so much. And he wants you to live life to the fullest. So as we sing this next song, it's a good one. I heard him practicing it. It's perfect. I would love 
for you to come down. I would love to meet with you and pray with you. We have our staff that's here, prayer partners that would love to pray over you. So as we worship, would you do so and come down and let Jesus do what only he can do. Amen. Love you guys.